Well, good evening to you. I'm going to just do like that. All right. Well, first of all, it's great to see you, and um, we bring you greetings from Kansas in the Midwest. Um, our family has, we'll eventually have 14 of us here, I think, so, right? Yeah. Well, Shannon, and uh, oh, there you are. You made it. Good to see you. There you are. And then we have uh, Mr. and Mrs. Weaver, the juniors. They're coming in tomorrow, so that'll be great. So we want to bring you greetings. Um, it's a real privilege and honor to be here with you personally, uh, and it's not so much an honor to be... Oh, no, no, just with Chris. I meant with Chris. Just, just, I was kidding. Yeah. So you'll get even, I know. You, know. you might want to comb your hair, brother. Okay. You'll get so even. All right. Well, listen, tonight we want to uh, open the Scriptures to 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 5. And uh, this evening, I'd like to introduce and talk about this concept of what it means to quench not the Spirit. And uh, at first glance, it should be very um, startling to you that mere pieces of dust can actually have such a profound effect upon God himself. Do you realize that? That's what he's saying. That God is so um, intimately connected with you and I that in all the things that he is, in all his majesty, in all his omnipotence, we could actually quench him. Doesn't that bother you in the smallest way? Doesn't that make you think twice? What in the world? How could I do that? What does that look like? Is that even possible? How might I do that is the question. So tonight, I'd like to introduce this conversation, and we will begin reading in the latter 20% of the book of Thessalonians, and of course, we'll, we'll sort of culminate uh, around verse 22. So if you have your Bibles open, I'm going to begin reading. I, I, I said verse 1 of chapter 5, but actually... I want to begin reading in uh, uh, chapter 4. Let's see, I forgot how I do this, Patrick. Which way do I swipe? Oh, this way? It's not swiping. Hmm? Go the other way? I have my personal audio visual. <laughs> Oh, no, I don't mind. There. All right, thank you. All right, we're going to begin reading in verse 13 of chapter 4. It reads like this. Till I come... Oh, sorry. Let's get in the right chapter. It says this, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, and an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first." Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace, safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us 
who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as, the helmet, as, as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should be together, we should live together with Him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, and abstain from every form of evil. You know, I read this whole context on purpose. Obviously, my focus will be on verses 19 through 22, but the context is very important for us this evening. It begins by talking about the coming of the Lord, and, and perhaps you, you had that, that uh, uh, a twinge of, of of fur on the back of your neck stand up as we read about the coming of the Savior and meeting us in the clouds and we would be joined with Him. And we love that phrase. It says, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Amen? Now that will be special. Some have gone before us already. They have already seen the Lord. I've not seen the Lord. I am looking forward to seeing the Lord. It sounds crazy, but I wonder what color of eyes he has. But you know what I'm really looking for? I'm looking for a, a tremendous smile on the face of the Lord Jesus. And I want him to smile at us, not because I'm just there, but I want him to smile because he's, he's happy to see me. That I've run the race well. And he's glad the race was run well. And so it begins with that context. It then switches over to this context called the day of the Lord, which is that really day of judgment. And, he, and the language of that passage, the language of that passage uh, bespeaks of that idea, the day of the Lord and, and, its, and its wrath and how some uh, are unaware of the suddenness of destruction. Others, uh, like us, we would expect this kind of destruction and he says there should be a positive response. You should positively respond. You should, you should be a, a living as if you're in the day, in light, and knowing that these things will come. Comfort one another with these words uh, for those who wait for his return. And he tells us you should, you should uh, uh, do a few things differently. And that begins in verse 12. And in those particular verses, he says, We urge you, brethren, that you first of all have unity within. Look at that. It says in verse 12, recognize those who labor among you, who are over you in the Lord. That has to be. There is, there is, there is a sense in the Scriptures and in the body of Christ where there has to be this, this order that we call headship, this, this uh, uh, duplication of what it means to, to have loving authority and willing submission. And he addresses that by this particular command. And he says, now you should have a certain attitude towards those in authority. And you should esteem them. You should highly regard them. For it because of their love and because of your love for them. I tell you, I've been in many assemblies and there are a lot of places that don't love their elders. Many places think of their elders as a necessary evil. I want you to know that based on the authority of the Word of God, they are a necessary component to the whole idea of headship and it's been God-authored. And I think sometimes our nature of sin rebels against anything that has a structure of authority because that's the way sin is. 
Here he, he says, listen, because of what's happening, his return, the day of the Lord, you should think to things differently. You should foster unity. You should, you should extinguish disunity. Look at what it says in verse 14. We exhort you, uh, 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 warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. Help those who are weak, he says. Be patient. Don't return evil for evil. You extinguish all those factors of disunity. You get rid of those factors. You deal with them and deal with them well. And then he says, you foster internal unity. And this is where we're getting closer to our verses of concern. He says in verse 16, rejoice always. How do you rejoice always? You ever try to do that? Some people in this world are just happy all the time. I hate them. <laughs> Don't you? Hey, you having a good day? Yeah, never have a bad one. <laughs> yeah, how, how, how's, the, how's the rain working for you? Love it. Wish we had more. <laughs> Rejoice always. How do you do that? Just, you just put on a positive outlook? Are you just kind of a positive thinker? No. You rejoice always because you rejoice in the presence of the Lord Jesus. And this is in the context he's saying you should know the presence is of the Lord Jesus will come back for you. And in that day of wrath, you will be with Him. You're aware of that. So you will be saved from the wrath because you will be with Him. So you rejoice always because of the presence, the ever God consciousness of His presence with you and the Spirit of God living within your flesh and bones. That's how you rejoice always. There's a different outlook. There's a different, there's a different way to view things. This week, I had many moments where I was not rejoicing in the presence of the Lord. I was not rejoicing in His particular perspective and how He viewed situations. I let obstacles become my irritations. That is not rejoicing always. And then He says this, how do you have internal unity? Pray without ceasing. How do you do that? Well, let me tell you, the first part is not, the, the, the second part is what we focus on without ceasing, but many of us never hit the first part, which is simply to pray. Do you, do you know how the will of God is done on the earth? Do you know how actually you bring the will of God that is always done in heaven upon this earth? How does that happen? Is it because we know the will of God? Is it because we're very versed in being able to cite chapter and verse on, on the, the statements of God's will? Is it because we understand the ways of God and how He uses the weak and the base to confound the things that are? How He allows that famous phrase, the death of a vision, so that He might raise up His own vision? Is that what it is about? Is that, how, uh, is, is that what it means to, to pray without ceasing? I submit to you that the will of God to be done, that's always done in heaven, to be done on the earth, is done in one word. Prayer. Jesus said it this way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in heaven, on earth, as it is in heaven. There is no other way that the will of God will be brought behind enemy lines unless we pray. The hardest part is not, is, is not the clause without ceasing. The hardest part for us is to pray to begin with. And I submit to you, saints, that we are a pitiful, praying people. I don't mean where we recite lists to God. I don't mean where we, we go through the roll call of those who are ill. No, I don't mean that they're not important. And I don't mean that lists are, 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 are obsolete and, and cumbersome. But what I do mean is that we have, to be, we have to foster a heart that pours out our soul before the Heavenly Father in heaven. And that's our problem. We allow ourselves to go so far in prayer, but not to empty our souls at the throne of grace. That's the difference. Pray without ceasing. I would suggest to you that if we could master the first word, the second clause would naturally flow. But I digress. What other things bring this internal unity? Thanksgiving and everything. <laughs> you know that famous story, you know, the guy that has the flat tire gets out and thanks the Lord, but he has to thank the Lord for the rain too while he fixes the flat tire, right? Is that really what it's about? Or thanking the Lord that uh, my tire is flat, but it's, it's not raining. That, you know, that, I, that the worst thing didn't happen to me. Is that what it's about? Is that what it means to thank the Lord in everything? 
that, it, that it, it, it could have been worse, and so thank you for not making it worse? Uh, I don't think so. What is Thanksgiving? <laughs> well, doctor, you should know, you idiot. Well, no, let me tell you something. Thanksgiving does something to your soul. You know what it does to you? It puts God in His rightful place. When you thank God, you are by default taking a place, a posture that puts God in His proper place, acknowledging what He's done, and therefore receiving His purposes and orienting your soul to His particular plan and procedure. In that state of mind, we therefore turn around and we thank God for what He is doing, what He has been doing, what He is doing, and what He will do. And that we can trust His purposes, even though they are, they are so contrary to what we might feel, what we might think, and what we might actually imagine. And in that moment, when thanksgiving is expressed, you elevate God to where He ought to be. Chris and I became familiar today with some very sad news. We've had the privilege to be in the Bahamas in the last year. In fact, we were there in January. You left just before I arrived. Thank you very much, brother. But we have some very dear friends, don't we, Chris? One of them lost their daughter tragically in an accident at around 9 o'clock this morning. She was eight years old. She's, she's the age, she was the age of my youngest. I, I don't know. I, I literally did not know how to be thankful in everything at that moment. And I'm, I'm not even the father, or, and my wife is not the mother, but we ached with them, and, and we, we, couldn't, we, we couldn't quite wrap our minds around how, how God, but we, we came to a point where simply we can say, Father, we don't know, we don't understand, we don't, it makes no sense, it, 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 it aches to the very core of our soul, but somehow we know that thanks can be given to you because you are still on the throne and although this, this is totally contrary to a human heart's natural bent, we confess your kingship again. Thank you for being king. Pray without ceasing in everything. Give thanks. You see, this is what uh, the will of God is. It says so right there in the text. You can read it for this is the will of God. Uh, wow, what is that? To put Christ at His proper place. That's what makes one happy in the Lord. And finally, we get to this section that I really want us to focus on, and it's, it's, it's this idea of internal unity. This idea of unity within your own person. And he's going to talk about several examples of that in the text. And tonight, I just want to talk about what it means to to do not quench the Spirit, or the negative, quench not the Spirit of God. How, how can this be done? Well, as I mentioned to you, it'll, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about quenching not the Spirit by having the right attitude towards the Word of God. Do not despise prophecies. Um, we'll have the right attitude in testing all things. And what does that mean? And holding fast to what is good and abstaining from every form of evil. Those are all examples of not quenching the Spirit of God. But let's just look tonight at this idea of quenching. We first of all have to wrestle with this ver verse 19, do not quench what? The Spirit. Part of our problem is that we, we have an anemic, if not incredibly deficient understanding of who and what purpose is the Spirit of God within us. I want to spend just a few minutes talking just about that. And um, where's our, uh, our master of ceremonies? David, what time am I supposed to stop? Nine o'clock. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Very kind. Probably eight fifteen. Eight thirty. This is good. This is very good. All right. Okay, so in this particular text, you'll notice that the definite article the is used. And the word spirit itself means uh, the word spirit means breath. Now, it's, it's hard to conceptualize this, but I, I, I want to try to get you to understand what God means by His Spirit within you. Now, um, and some of you might have heard this illustration before, but let me just briefly mention it. The word breath is, is very picturesque, and in order for you to understand that, 
If you take a deep breath in, which you all are probably doing as we speak, and just hold it for a minute, just hold it, I'll tell you when you can pass out. But um, as, if you want to say something that's in your mind, in order for you to say what's in your mind, you then have to let the air out of your chest, and it goes past your vocal cords, which are two little pieces of tissue that vibrate ever so slightly back and forth, so that you can actually make crisp and clear, articulate sounds that have a symbol, a meaning associated with each symbol. In other words, what's in your chest physically is exhaled so that all that is within you internally, including what's in your mind to speak, now is articulated outwardly. And that's the idea of the Spirit of God. All that is within the heart of God, all that uh, the Spirit of God knows the deep things of God, everything about God is now then exhaled in such a way that such a breath now becomes the oxygen, that which we breathe, to sustain our life. Do you see all that picturesque description there? And that's the idea of, this, of the Spirit, of, at least in, in one type of facet. So the Spirit of God being, we would say, the third person of the Trinity. We don't mean third as in, like, third in rank. We just mean that there's three uh, essence uh, uh, of our three different persons of God, one essence of God. Uh, he is indeed God, described as omniscience and omnipresent and omnipotent, but how, how do I describe Him in, in a fashion that maybe gives a little color, more color to this? Not only is He the expression of the very inner thinking of God Himself, Him he being God, He knowing the deep things of God, But he also is what I would call the vitality of life. Now, you don't have to turn there, but if you look in Psalm 104.30, you'll read this this very interesting phrase, and it says, you send, the animal life is upon the planet, and if you take your spirit away, they die. But if you bring your spirit back into that animal life, they live. In other words, there's a sense of that God's Spirit imparts and gives life. And that's kind of picturesque because in the book of Genesis, it says that God breathed life into mankind, right? And so we have this idea that God in His Spirit form is not just some sort of uh, force field. That's what the world thinks, that He's some sort of cube of energy, some electromagnetic force that sort of orients itself according to the planets. You know what we call that? A bunch of lies. But what we really mean is that God has put, is, is placing Himself in His spirit form so that He brings life to you. That's why it makes so much sense the Spirit of God would raise Jesus Christ from the dead because He brings life. Now, when we talk about life, as I've described it, I just talked about just the idea of, of living. But there's more to life than living, right? We, we, we're all familiar with perhaps the patient that is alive but it's comatose. So physically they're alive, but they're not living life, are they? And what God does in His Spirit is He brings the life of God, living the life of God to you, so that there's activity, there's attitude, there's a game changers. There's where I used to be a man who loses my temper, and now I don't lose my temper because the vitality, the living of life of God is now permeating through me, and that's what the Spirit of God does. What He does is He so intertwines Himself with your new soul that has been raised with Jesus Christ that you can't now tell the difference between you and God because you've been homogeneously mixed together so that all the, if I may, all the particles of God are mixed with all the particles of you and so that there's just a consistency of God in your life. The vitality of God is within you. If I say to, uh, well, Chris, thank you for volunteering. If I say, Brother Schroeder, um, where do you live? He'll take me to his house, which I've been to in Richmond there, and, and, uh, and, and it's a beautiful home, and it has a beautiful backyard, but that's not what I'm talking about. I say, Chris, where do you live the life of Chris Schroeder? What does that look like? Well, that's when I stayed with Chris, and you know what? 
We have a grand time because Chris has a vibrant life. And if you ever visited with him for five minutes, you know that he has a passion for the things of God. And he has a passion for souls. And he's a passion for the Word of God. And I see what drives him and what moves him and what takes him to different conclusions and, and forces him to do certain activities. I see his life, not just his residence. And that's what God means when his spirit dwells within you. See, if we, do, if we fail to describe that, then we really don't understand how anything could be quenched. But if you understand the vitality of God within you, God in action, that's what it says in Matthew 12 and Luke, 12 and Luke 20, what you, in, in Genesis 1, 1 through 3, how the Spirit of the Lord moved across the face of the waters, you understand that there's a lot of dynamism to His presence in you. Now, Quenching that, suffocating that, should surprise you. How can mere me, made of dust, as it says in the book of Genesis, can have such a profound, squelching effect on the giver of life? How can that be? Well, I would submit to you that it can happen. And I'm going to describe to you at least three ways tonight in which that can happen. What does the word quench mean? The word quench means something very interesting. It means to stifle, dampen, hinder from full influence of of something like light or sound. Think of it uh, as uh, the light bulb, which you then put some type of shade, some type of of filter around so that the pure uh, presentation of that light is no longer seen. It has a, it's clouded. And many of us do that because if we were to to unmask a light bulb, it would be too bright for our eyes, very uncomfortable. But what it means spiritually is that we can actually suppress the full influence of the Spirit of God. Do you understand that? God, God doesn't have to let you have that effect upon Him, but He is doing something in such a way, He interacts with you in such a way that He will allow Himself to be suppressed by you and I. That should scare you. That should make you serious about the things of God. That should rivet you that this is a very, very important matter. Now, it's very, uh, it, it, this whole discussion is... Um, is uh, Uh, equivalent or uh, related to this word grieve. Quench the Spirit, grieve not the Spirit. It's in Ephesians 4.30. It's in the the active voice. And here's what it means here. To cause pain. Do not grieve the Spirit of God. You know what that means? Do not cause God to pain. Can you imagine that? Can you? Did you really think that you, uh, you could cause God to be distressed? God to have grief? And the answer is, most certainly so. Now, I, I, I've taken this word grief, and, and, I, and a passage in the New Testament that uses this is 2 Corinthians 2, and I'm using grief and its corollary concept, quench, just in this passage. I put it up here just to show you its usage. And notice here, Paul says, uh, for if I make you sorrowful, that's grief, then, the who, who, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who was made sorrowful by me? Now, what does this mean? Paul's saying this. Listen, and this context in 2 Corinthians 2.12 was talking about how he had to come and speak sort of roughly to the Corinthians. And he said, you know, I, 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 I really pain over this fact that, that I've, I've had to uh, uh, bring sorrow to you, to make you sad, to make you uh, uh, pain. And I, I don't want to do that again. And, and if I make you pained again, if I, if I hurt you again, how will I be comforted with my hurt? Do you see that emotionally driven like language? And what God is saying in this idea of grieving, that is, is that I can be pained by you. I can be suppressed by you. The diminishment of my full expression can be by you. I can be grieved by you. I can be pained by you. You know, I have to tell you, I have to tell you something. I stopped in my Christianity, and I began to realize that I can hurt my dad, if I may. I mean that very, very honorably to the Lord. You see, it wasn't too long ago, uh, my father living with us, that in some way I, I hurt my father. I wasn't sure exactly what I did or exactly what I said, but I I wouldn't put it past me to have been very 
curt or something like that. That's ashamedly so my way. And I heard him. And, and when, I, when he wanted to tell me about it, I had to, to really wait for him to express it. It was very hard. And when he finally expressed it, he was crying. I, I made my father cry. If I can make my earthly father cry, is it possible to make my heavenly father shed a tear? If I can diminish the brilliance of another soul's expression of who they are and what they are, is it possible that I could quench the Spirit of God? You see, what God does is He says, I'm going to give you free will, but let me tell you something. When I give you free will, when I give you that aspect of who you are, I put myself at risk. And the risk that I'm taking is that there is a, uh, there, there's a chance that you might actually do the wrong thing. You might quench the Spirit of God or, or, or dampen the Spirit of God. You might grieve the Spirit of God. I actually risk that from you. But there's a tremendous upside that it can produce the richest expression of a love from the, uh, from the creature to the Creator ever possible. And when God has this concept of quenching the Spirit of God, embedded in it is this idea that, that, that it, 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 it has the potential to bolster the tremendous closeness that a human being can have with the Creator of the universe ever possible. Because He gives you the opportunity to either choose to please Him or choose to quench Him or choose to grieve Him. That's how this happens. It's not that God is weak or God is emotionally compromised and He's damaged goods. No! God specifically allows Himself to be in a situation where mere created beings could have that kind of effect upon who He is and what He is. And boy, let me tell you, I have done my share of causing heaven to shed tears. Now, we're not the only ones in this situation that has done this. There's there's three individuals I've selected tonight to talk about who's done this in the Word of God. One of them, as you can see, is Saul, and this is in chapter 13. Now, you might want to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13, as we'll spend just a few minutes there, and, and uh, I hope that we'll be able to get through all three. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the story... Saul's been in power for two years, and he by this time has selected 3,000 special forces. 2,000 were at his disposal, and 1,000 was at the disposal of his right-hand general, Jonathan, his son. The Philistines were at Giba, and, and, and that was somewhat close to the hometown, Gibeah, of uh, Saul. And Jonathan attacked the Philistines and, and made the Israelite nation to be sort of a burr under the saddle of the Philistines. In fact, they, it says in the scriptures there that they were a stench to the, to the Philistines. And so uh, uh, the Philistines uh, amassed a force to, to reckon with this sort of uh, little cockroach under their skin. And so when they did that, Saul calls for all the Israelites to also come and array themselves for battle. But, but they were too afraid. And they began to flee. And, and the, as they looked at the size of the Philistine army, and, and thus they began to desert. And so what Saul did was he, he went to Gilgal. He saw the people were deserting. And, and Samuel was going to come to meet him at Gilgal, but he was delayed up to that time limit of seven days. And, and so what Saul does is he makes an independent decision, and I'd like you to read it in chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and a peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. And now it happened, as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what? Have you done? You see, 
The scenario was, was pressing on Saul. And Saul said, oh, 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 people are leaving. Where is Samuel? Oh, no, what's going to happen? The Philistines are huge. I better do something. And so he makes an independent decision. And this is my point. Independence is a risk factor for producing grief and quenching the Spirit of God. He makes this decision, but, but notice what he does next. It, he justifies. L- look at verse 11. When Saul said, what have, Samuel said, what have you done? He said, well, well, well I, I saw the people, and, and, and they were scattered, and, and, and you, 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 you didn't come. Can you hear this? It justifies himself. And, and the Philistine, they were the three things. They're all the, and, and so, and I didn't have time to seek God and everything. I, I, independence justifies. You talk about things that will quench the Spirit of God. This spirit of independence is one of those things which definitely uh, quenches, or quenches the Spirit of God. And it's this idea of independence versus dependence. I said it this way. It's attentive but not total. That is, I'm attentive to what you have to say. I heard what you had to say. I'm sensitive to what you have to say. But I'm not submissive to you. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm soft. I, I'm sort of malleable to you. But I'm not surrendered. That's what independence does. And I don't know about you, but I have a huge streak of an independent spirit of God. And guess what that does? That squelches, that quenches the uh, spirit of God within my life. I'll plan it. And I'll, and I'll ask the Lord to bless it. You know, so much of my, my early Christian existence has been spent on saying, well, this seems like a good idea. I'm sure you'll agree, God. Let's go. And that doesn't work. Sometimes we have this independent spirit that quenches the Spirit of God in this way. We say, well, I know what God says, and we equate that to be an acceptable action of doing what God says. But I have to tell you that knowing and doing are two different beasts because the author of James says it this way. We have to be more than mere uh, 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 know the Word of God. We have to be doers of the Word of God. Obedience to his word, not just knowledge of it, is what's at stake. And anything less than that is an independence of God or from God that quenches the Spirit of God. Are you independent tonight? Are you one that finds independence, your natural go-to disposition before God? Did you know that quenches the Spirit of God? Did you know that has a way of dampening God's Spirit within your soul who lives within you? My friends, we cannot be independent. We can't be just, just planning our own way and thinking our own things and, and saying, oh, God, I'm sure you'll think it's a good idea. And by chance, if you're not too busy, would you just kind of show up at the event and bless it all? That's not how this works. We are dependent upon God, and that's what prayer does for you, and that's what thanksgiving is about, and that's what rejoicing in the Lord also fosters. It creates a dependent spirit on God. That's why you're so happy. That's why you have such joy. Because you trust in the one who is the only trustworthy one. There's a a cohesion between you and God that you're actually working conjointly, but you're working under his direct authority and leadership. This was almost the failure of Joshua. He almost ran aground here. He got the army together. They're all organized. He's thinking about the battle. The commander of the army of the Lord shows up and he says, whose side are you on, on my side or their side? And the commander of the army of the Lord says, no, no. I'm not on their side. I'm not on your side. I'm the commander commander of the army of the Lord of hosts. Do you know what that means? Joshua, you are not the general. You are an enlisted man, and I am the commander. You are on my side. See the difference? Independence is a killer to the work of the Spirit of God. Now, this one here, my second example of what what it is, a picture of what it means to quench the Spirit of God is failure at true repentance. This is in 1 Samuel 15, and again, I'll have to be quite fast. But you know, this was the commandment that God gave to Saul that you must, you must deal with the Amalekites. And, and uh, as Saul uh, uh, gathers, uh, uh, gathers everybody, he, he releases the, I think it was the uh, Midianites or the ones from Jethro's line, and, and he partially obeys the command. He did not annihilate and eliminate everybody, 
but he kept the king alive and he kept the best of the livestock. You're, you're familiar with the story, I'm sure. Uh, and, and what happens there is that that's a real statement for Saul's authority and recognition. See, I've got my enemy, the king in my hand, and I've got all of his riches. Ha ha! I'm king! And believe me, that was a ploy, I think, by Saul to hang on to this uh, 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 sovereignty that he thought he had because God had already told him it was going to be taken out of his hand. He was resisting God. And so uh, uh, Samuel hears about it, and he comes, he confronts Saul in ch and ch chapter 15, verses 13 through 19. And notice what he does in verse 20 and 21 of 1 Samuel 15. He says this, And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I've gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me, and brought back Agag, king of the Amalekite, a king of Amalek. Stop right there, Saul. There was never anything in the command of God to bring back Agag. Never, Saul. And I have utterly destroyed the Amalekite. No, you haven't, Saul. I don't know what you're drinking or smoking, but you've got it backwards. You didn't do exactly what God said to do. In fact, you did the exact opposite. But do you hear the arrogance of Saul? But I did obey the Lord. What's wrong with you, man? You didn't obey the Lord God. The evidence of such is is, is, is resounding in the ear of, of Samuel, and he's saying, you can't say that. But this is what we do when we are quenching the Spirit of God. We proclaim our direct obedience when the evidence of such obedience is so loud it deafens the ear. My friends, I have to ask you this. Are you quenching the Spirit of God tonight? by proclaiming perfect, profound obedience to God in his heart, but in reality, you've only fooled yourself that you have only partially obeyed God. And the part that you selected to obey was just the part that appeased your conscience and let you conclude a lie that you really did obey God when you didn't. It's a common phenomenon, and there's many believers that fall prey to this whole dynamic. It's called the deceitfulness of sin. Are you being deceived by your own sin tonight? That quenches the Spirit of God. And finally, finally, I have to move on past this one. Finally, there's this idea of David. David and Bathsheba. I, I, I'll, I'll, let me just finish with this. You see, Saul went on to be approached by Samuel. And, Sa and Samuel said, no, God desires you to obey rather than sacrifice because anything less than that is equivalent with, with, cha with, with playing with the demons, witchcraft. And stubbornness is like wor worshiping an idol. You're basically worshiping yourself. You can't do that, Saul. You can't do that. And I suggest to you tonight that sometimes our repentance is like the variety of Saul. We, we, are, we are upset, we are broken because we got caught or we made a mess or I hurt somebody I love or I embarrassed myself or I embarrassed my family I, or, or, or I just, I'm sorry, I just wish I had back what I wanted. And my favorite is this one, I, I just chose the wrong door. You know, I, I, just, I should have chose chose door number two rather than door number one. If only I would have known. That's not repentance. That's not brokenness. That quenches the Spirit of God. It's a false statement, and it only appeases your conscience that you're doing the right thing before God, but you are categorically doing the wrong thing before God. And so I'm going to ask you, as we start this conference together, and I don't mean to be so loud, nor do I mean to be so blunt, but I don't think we can avoid the soberness of this moment. Are you quenching the Spirit of God? Are you behaving as Saul behaved, perhaps, in 1 Samuel 13, when he just did his own thing? He looked like it was the right move. We had this scenario. Things were falling apart around me. I had to do something. Let me tell you something. That independence squel squel squelches, 
quenches the Spirit of God. Or are you like the Saul of chapter 15? I did obey. Really, I did. Just look, examine me. Oh, yeah, there's Agag, but oh, by the way, did you know the people wanted him? He didn't repent. He blamed. And, and, and then he sort of repented. He said, oh, well, well, Samuel, why don't you come with me? Because the people, and, and I can't worship God if you're not there, and, and the people need to see you with me. He was only worried about himself. It was only partial. And that's why these things are said. I'm upset because I got caught. I'm upset because I made a mess. I'm upset because I embarrassed myself. I'm upset for all the wrong reasons. You should be upset because you pained the heart of God himself. Saints, I don't think we think that way. I don't think we regard sin like that. I don't think we understand the gravity of what it means to quench the living God of the universe who lives within your temple. That is such a serious matter. The angelic hosts know what it's about. The angelic hosts know His omniscience. The angelic hosts know His omnipresence. The angelic hosts know everything about God, and yet they would, I'm sure, gasp at us at how we so easily and quickly suffocate the God of the universe by His sovereign allowance because of our independence, for example, because of our Fake repentance, for example. And my third example tonight would have been David. Oh, the man who was a hypocrite, wasn't he? Did you know in his cover-up towards Bathsheba, he faked everything. He faked that he was interested in the battlefront. He faked it when he, when he called Uriah, uh, Uriah home. He faked that he was, he was uh, celebrating with his comrade and he got him drunk so he would think that he slept with his wife. He faked a battle strategy so that it would execute Uriah. He faked being upset and conciliatory for the loss of a fallen soldier. And he faked being concerned about Bathsheba when in reality he was just covering up his sin and the child that came from their relations. He faked everything and the only person who was, who was happy about it was David. God said he was displeased. You know why he's displeased? Because God hates hypocrisy. Out of all the people on the planet Jesus Christ took on on his days on the earth, it was the Pharisees. They, they got the most press in the New Testament. And what's the primary thing he said to the, new, to the Pharisees? A whole chapter in Matthew is devoted to it. This is what he said. You hypocrites. God can't stand this sort of thing. It quenches the Spirit of God. It quenched the, 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 the whole thing with David and his progression as king. And it changed everything in his kingdom after that. Quenching the Spirit of God is such a big deal. And it shows up in independence, and it shows up in this whole idea of, of uh, 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 untrue repentance, and it shows up in hypocrisy. It's all those things. And I've just given you three examples which corrupts and corrodes our walk with our Heavenly Father. I ask you tonight, saints, would you please consider this? Do I suffocate? the breath of God. Let's pray. Father, we come to you tonight with really quite a weighty matter. Lord, when I look at my own life, when I look at my own heart, I see countless times where I have choked, if I may, the breath of God. I've had a hard heart. I've had a stubborn spirit. I was going to do what I wanted to do anyway, and no one was going to tell me otherwise, whether it be my wife, my children, and certainly not the Spirit of God. Father, I have lived that way. I have said things to you that I should never have said. I have whined and complained to you in ways I should never have done. Father, I have quenched you. I have been the rate-limiting step of seeing the will of God done on earth as it is always done in heaven. And I want to confess to you tonight that I need your restoration. I repent. I repent. I don't want to be that man. I don't want to look like that man. I don't want to smell like that man. I, do, I repent. Oh, God, make me like your son. In Jesus' name, amen.